This event was sponsored by Spock, the Bootsy Lab for Beautiful Things, PS PDF Kit. With the JavaScript library, you can view and annotate PDF files in the browser. Features include cross-browser support, mobile-optimized UI, and no server-side component. Wild, a digital branding studio, they love GIFs, beer, and weird shit. XXX Lutz, their tech team, XXXL Digital creates all digital experience for XXL Lutz, Mobilix, and Momax all over Europe. So yeah, I'm Jared. I do mobile and web development at Khan Academy. And we're uh, an education technology uh, company trying to provide a free world-class education for anyone, anywhere. Um, I got involved in Reason, oh, a year and a half ago, maybe, um, just when it was getting started. And I'm really excited to see how it's grown. Um, and I hope by the end of this, you'll be excited about it, too. So why Reason? Um, what's, what's the problem we're trying to solve? Aren't there enough languages out there? Um, well. So Jordan Walk, who, who started Reason and also created React, um, he said that we want people to be able to use an awesome, well-typed, powerful language at work, not just in your free time. Um, and and it, a lot of us are probably writing JavaScript at work, and we, we feel the pain, right? I mean, JavaScript is super fun to get started, um, really easy to, to get off the ground, but then you start working on a larger project, you start working with more people, and, and suddenly it's not so fun anymore. Um, and so you, you reach out, you find ClojureScript, you find Reason, you find Elm, um, and, and suddenly it's fun again. So we're, we're trying to bring these more um, awesome languages to the masses, and that's, that's kind of the Reason project. Um, so in, in order to deliver on this, we, we need two things. One is we need the language to be easy to get started with. Because um, if, if it's not easy to get started with, you're not going to be able to sell it to your team. You're not going to be able to sell it to your boss. But then the, the whole reason we want to use this language is that it makes things easier to maintain. I'm going to focus on those two things, adoption and maintenance. Um, and to start this off, when um, several years ago I was using Angular on a large team, um, big code base. And when I first got into Angular, I was super excited about how easy it was to get started. Um, you just include a script tag, you add an attribute to your DOM, and suddenly you can make forms so much easier than using Bootstrap or using jQuery and Backbone, which were kind of the dominant paradigms at the time. But then on a large team, I got super bogged down because of kind of the, the way that Angular was designed. It didn't give you a lot of structure. It didn't give you a lot of help. And suddenly there was state being mutated all over the place. In order to make a simple change, you had to read through several thousand line files, and it was just a mess. Um, and so about that time, React came out and gave some more structure around data management, around um, the, the way that you're allowed to mutate data, the way you're allowed to send data around. And suddenly, it was a lot easier to, to work on larger projects. But um, kind of as JavaScript, as JavaScript developed, as React developed, People wanted to add more things into JavaScript to make it more maintainable, um, adding new features. And suddenly, adoption got harder, um, where there was JavaScript fatigue. There was all this boilerplate, all, this, all these things to set up. And so there, there's kind of some conflict potential here between making it easy to get started and easy to keep going. Um, I tried to graph a little bit um, this this space of things. So JavaScript is super easy to adopt. Um, Haskell, I, I don't know if any of you have adopted Haskell. I've had a really hard time um, getting started with that. Elm has kind of taken Has Haskell over to make it much easier to adopt. And in, in restricting um, what the language is capable of, they've actually made maintenance a little bit easier too, in my opinion. Um, and reason, we're, we're kind of coming from an, the other direction. We want more ease of adoption and compromising a little bit from, from that height in maintenance. Now, I, I break out ES6 here because I think the things that we've added to JavaScript, the new arrow function, the let, the const, all async, await, th these aren't things that, have, that were barriers to people getting started. right? It doesn't help you get started with JavaScript to have three ways to declare a variable. <laughs> It helps you when you're in a large team. When you're working with a lot of people and you say, let, you know, use const all over the place, it will make our lives easier. And so there's kind of this back and forth. I think 
I think it's better overall to have ES6, but we, we traded off some ease of adoption. So what are the aspects? What are we doing with Reason to make it easier to adopt? The first thing I want to talk about is syntax. Um, and actually, people, um, the, there are some funny opinions about syntax, where if you've been using a certain kind of syntax for a long time, and then somebody shows up with a different one, you get all up in arms. Um, and Reason started with, is a layer on top of OCaml, um, where OCaml has, uh, has been around for 20 years um, and has users that are very excited about it. And then we, we come in and we say, hey, we're making this new syntax. Guess what? It's super like JavaScript. And like a lot of people came in really mad about it. Um, funnily enough, some of them who came in mad said, why are you worrying about syntax? It doesn't matter. Um, which is funny because they were, they're mad about it. So maybe it matters. <laughs> um, but what, something that's validated me is some of those people came back later saying, actually, it did help. I showed it to my teammates, and it helped a lot that it was more like JavaScript. It helped a lot that it, it was one less thing to learn. And Chang Lu, um, who's uh, kind of one of the main uh, leaders of the Reason Project, said, you know, he, he works at Facebook, and he um, uses Reason on Messenger.com with, with several other people. So he, do, he doesn't have any trouble convincing his boss, uh, clearly. But um, what, what he's doing is making a concerted effort to ease adoption, to make it easy for the rest of us who have to say, hey, look, here's this new language. Do you want to give it a try? And somehow making the syntax more like something they've already seen is just one less barrier to entry. So here, here's a little bit what this looks like. Here's, here's the old OCaml. Um, and if you know Elm or if you know Haskell, um, th this is ML-like syntax. Um, you see, when, when you're applying functions, you're, let's see, you're, you're calling a function and you don't have any parentheses, you don't have any commas, um, and when you declare a variable, you have to say it's in this, this next scope. So first version of reason, which is um, the current version, th this next one's coming out hopefully this week, um, added some semicolons, which some people like, some people don't, again. Um, and it added, made it so you don't have to put in. You can just make declarations more the way you would from JavaScript. Added an arrow function and some curly braces. And then the, the new syntax that is just coming out adds a lot of parentheses. So if you like parentheses, this is great. If not, again, you might get mad. <laughs> um, so parentheses, comma, parentheses all over the place. Um, I was talking to, to somebody who really likes closure script and closure. He was like, I like parentheses, but not in there. <laughs> They're in the wrong place. You put, you put this one on that side, and then it's fine. So um, anyway, th so th this, this is getting a lot more like JavaScript. And hopefully it will, again, just ease the adoption, make it one less thing to learn. Um, and I was watching a talk given by a developer down in, in Sydney, Australia, who um, has started using Reason on her team. And she said, it didn't even feel like learning a new language. Um, it just felt like we were coming from JavaScript and adding some rules. And I, I think that's a win. Um, some people might, might disagree, say, if it's a new language, it, it should feel different. But I think the fewer things that get in your way when you're moving to a platform that has so much better um, maintenance uh, characteristics, so much better support and checks for the developer, the better. So another thing with, with the Reason project, we are, we're trying to, to keep the JavaScript tool chain, right? So you use NPM for package management. You use Webpack for bundling, or Rollup, or whatever it is that you're currently using. Um, React has a first-class library um, that's really great in Reason. If you're familiar with Prettier from, from JavaScript, which takes your current JavaScript and automatically outputs a Prettier version, uh, it automatically formats everything to be consistent, um, it was actually based on reformat. Um, and if, if you know the Go ecosystem or the Rust ecosystem, they have similar tools. Um, and then these bottom three things, you actually don't, e don't need. Um, you don't need an extra transpiler. We, we've built in a pretty syntax for you. You don't need a lot of the linting that happens because type checking um, just removes a ton of failure cases. You don't need the boilerplate um, because we've, we've tried to pare down and just make everything built in. Um, and hopefully that, that'll just make it that much easier 
that when you get started with reason, you'll say, wait, is that all? So the, the third thing that we're doing to make it easy to get started from, from a JavaScript perspective is interop. And again, th this, is, this is another thing where there's a, a big spectrum of what you might want, actually. Um, and I tried to map that out here. Um, it might not be large enough. But I put Elm all the way over here. Flow and TypeScript are super close to JavaScript. And then Reason, and I threw ClojureScript on because I like it. Um, I don't know if you like it. But um, so who, who here is familiar with Elm? Done some Elm. Awesome. Uh, who, who here has like, written a smallish app in Elm? <laughs> OK. Yeah. All right. Um, ClojureScript, actually. I guess we, we've, got, we've got the ClojureScript folks here. Um, and Reason, I should have said that. Who, who here has heard about Reason before tonight? Awesome. Who here has written any, any code in Reason? OK. Anybody shipped anything in Reason? <laughs> awesome. Um, so anyway, so JavaScript interop is this interesting thing because Elm takes the, the perspective of we want to keep JavaScript at arm's length. Elm prioritizes safety. Like if, if you write your code, you are not going to have runtime exceptions because Elm doesn't have that. Um, and if you interop with JavaScript, we're, we're going we're gonna to check. We're going to make you do the effort to say we're, we're going to use this message passing protocol. Um, and they don't use NPM. So we're, we're, not, we're not going to get kind of polluted by, by all of the messy JavaScript that people write. Um, and for the people that love Elm, that is a huge benefit. Right? They say, we, we want more safety. Um, and I think that, that compromises on the adoption. Right? It, it makes it harder to get started because, oh, I, I can't just bail out to JavaScript um, as easily. Now, in, in Flow and TypeScript, I argue that is way too close to the metal, um, if JavaScript is the metal. Um, <laughs> where in Flow and TypeScript, you, you're going to interact with JavaScript you've already written all the time. Um, in many cases, you're, you're not going to know that there's a type error that, like, comes in from JavaScript and you misannotated it, and now it just like infects your whole program. Um, ClojureScript, I guess uh, I'll mention they have really great JavaScript interop, but they've um, less embraced the ecosystem. So you, you don't you don't generally use npm. Um, you you can these days, but um, it's it's more on the Java Maven ant kind of um, dependency management system. So reason we're we're embracing npm. Um, and we, we want you to be able to come from JavaScript, drop in bits of JavaScript if you need to, um, interact with NPM libraries um, so, that, so that you can really get started. And I, I have loved this, getting started with Reason. Um, here's an example of dropping in raw JavaScript. This is, uh, in fact, JavaScript. Um, and what, what I'm doing here is I'm, it's, this is a multi-line string, um, if you're familiar with JavaScript template strings. Like, so this, this is all just a string that then when it gets compiled, it's just left the same way. Um, and so I, and I'm saying, reason, I promise this is a function. Now, if I have a syntax error in here, it will break on the web page, right? So this, this is dangerous. If I return something that I said I wouldn't return, it will break at runtime, right? So th this, is, this is definitely a, um, compromising on safety if you go here. But the way, reason I love it is, when I'm getting started, when I'm playing around, when I see, so I get excited about the audio API, and I say, I want to try this out. So I go to the docs, and the docs have JavaScript examples. And I want to drop in a snippet. I don't want to translate it into my language. I just say, give it to me, and then it works. And that is magical. Um, a, a more, a little bit more complicated example, here, I'm, again, I'm doing a lot raw JavaScript. I recently got excited about the WebKit speech, or the speech recognition API. Um, where like you, you can you can tap in and say words and it will recognize them. Has anybody played with this before? Speech recognition or speech synthesis, where you I mean you, you can say say this out loud and it'll do it. It's so cool. Um, anyway, here's here's the JavaScript that ends up coming out. You can see this is just dumped as a block, and then later I say call this recognize function, hand it this function this callback function. Um, and then it's called right here. So again, this is, this is not a production tool, but it's a getting started tool, and I love it. Um, I'm, 
Actually, I think I want to demo um, using the speech API. So th this, is, this is the application that I was writing. It's a recipe manager. My wife and I love to cook, and we're, we're gathering new recipes. And I was like, what would, it would be so cool if, because when you're cooking, your hands are dirty. You, you don't want to go back and turn on your phone or like scroll through the page to find the recipes to, or to find the ingredients list. So you, you ask somebody who's standing near the recipe book or near the computer, hey, how many onions were there? Like, what was, what's the next step? So um, we'll, we'll see if this demo works. And I'll start with the easier one, where I say, so th this button will just read me the first instruction. Okay. Did, could you hear that? Is this? Yeah, the mic didn't work. Oh. How does the mic? How does the mic work? Maybe they turned it off. Did I break it? I may have broken it. How does the mic work? Does the mic? The mic was working at the beginning. Oh, try another one. This also is. This is why you don't do unannounced demos. Here we go. One more time. So all of you can know how to make chocolate mousse. There we go. You heard that. OK, that wasn't the cool part. Dang it. Oh, wow. We're getting high tech. How much sugar? One fourth of sugar. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> All righty. So, in in case the the recognition didn't work. Oh, QuickTime failed. It, fa it failed, or? Or I mean, or it just kills did something. That, that's fine. Oh, just is that what I did? Just keep it open. <laughs> right? By the way, I've started making a lot of chocolate mousse. <laughs> um, I, I learned how easy it was. And literally, like, the past three months, I've probably made it once a week. And it's so good. Um, that's right. Um, okay, just give us, a, give us both files afterwards. It's all fine. Okay. No, where, where's the? Uh, yeah, that's that's what I was wondering. Browser. We we lost something. Is it on your other? It's on the office page. Oh, how does operating systems work? Yeah, yeah. here it is. They probably don't. Look, look here. Look here. Oh. Top. What? Oh, because full screen. I hate Mac full screen. It's yeah, the worst. Yeah. Why did I ever do it? OK. I, I don't need the mic anymore. Wait, let me just switch it out. Cool. In case you need it. Also, Apollo's cool. Um, OK, chocolate mousse. You can just keep looking at that for a second. <laughs> All righty. And it's still listening. Oh, it's chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> I turned it off. All right. So that was using raw JavaScript. Um, and this is, this is where I copied the demo from. It, it was kind of a gratuitous demo, but I thought it was so cool. Um, OK. Right? That's a good idea. And I skipped something. Here we go. Um, so what, what if you don't want to be fast and loose and dangerous? Right, there, is, there is actually like a well-organized way to interact with JavaScript as well. Um, and there you, you kind of you declare the types. You declare kind of what you're working with. Th this is to inter interface with the Firebase API, because um, that, that app is also kind of Firebase-based. Um, and so you can say, hey, there's this module called Firebase, and I want you to call it, and that does some initialization. And then I want you to call auth on that, and then current user. And this is the JavaScript that it turns into. 
Um, and so this is, this is actually what you end up uh, doing in the day-to-day. -day. And this, this looks a lot like ClojureScript's JavaScript inter interface. Um, and so sometimes I start with the raw JavaScript because I just I want to get a demo going. And that's, that's what gets me going. Um, and then I convert it to the well-structured way. Or if it's not using some external API, then I, I actually do the work to convert it to just straight reason. Um, and this also helps, like, if there's some uh, algorithm where it's like, I don't know how to do it the right way. I don't know how to do it the immutable, like, not messing around with things way. I just want to write some JavaScript to mess with the array. Um, and then, you, then it unblocks you and you keep going. So that's, those are all the things about making it easy to adopt this language. But now I want to convince you that it, it's worth adopting. Um, because it will, it'll pay off in terms of maintenance cost. It'll pay off in terms of, I, I still like using this language even when it's on a many thousand line code base, even when it's with a dozen other people. Um, and the, the biggest thing here is the type system. Right? Um, OCaml's type system is uh, fantastic. Um, really powerful, has lots of, had lots of people working on it for, for the past 20 years. Um, and um, I guess, so who, who here is already sold on the idea of static typing and type checking? Like, you love it. Who here doesn't love it? OK, I was totally there a couple years ago. <laughs> um, and the, so the reason I didn't love it is because I, the, the first time I'd seen static types was with C++ and Java. Um, and it was in school, and I hated it. And then I, like, well, because I, I learned Python first, and I was like, what is this garbage? Like, this is so verbose, takes so long, gets in my face. I just want to do what I want to do. Um, but then I started working on large code bases, and actually having types saves you so many times. Um, and I, I think there's a, there's a good medium, because if you're working with Java, C++, it, it gets super verbose, and you're like, I don't want to repeat, repeat myself. Um, with the reason type system, um, and it's the same with Elm. It's the same with Flow. Um, the types get inferred for you. It just it knows from the code that you write. Okay, you you concatenated two strings together. The result is going to be a string. You did X. The result is going to be Y. Um, and then if you use something in a way it's not supposed to, like you thought this was an int, but actually it's a string, it'll yell at you at compile time and not at runtime. Um, if you're if you're like really skeptical about skeptical about types, I gave a talk about types in JavaScript um, that you can look up. Anyway, there was a really, so the type system gets rid of your JS doc comments where it's like, oh, by the way, this function takes an int, a string, a person, which looks like a user, and you know, you, you're kind of enumerating in comments, and then they get stale, and then um, things break and you don't know why. So types just give it to you and they don't get stale. Um, it takes care of a lot of linting, right? You don't have to lint. Um, like so, so many of the things that we lint for, uh, undefined is not a function, and you're using this wrong, and this wasn't defined, um, and you're assigning to this before it was, um, or you're using this before it was assigned, all that stuff. It just is gone because the type system does that for you. A l linting is like a, a really poor and quick and cheap type system. And then a lot of the unit tests that you end up writing in JavaScript in Ruby um, are, I gave this these values. Did it crash because they were the wrong types? No, it did not crash. Um, did it give me a thing that looks like a person? Yes, it did. It's like type system just does that for you. Um, I saw a quote on Twitter, and I, like, for the life of me, could not find it. But it was something like, unit tests cover what you can think of, the things that you can remember. Types cover everything, including the things that you forgot. Um, and I, I love the, the idea of a type system as th it's this automated system that's got your back. It's not there to yell at you. It's not there to get in your way. Um, it's there to keep you from breaking your tool for your users. Um, another big win with reason is immutability. Um, in the JavaScript world, we've started to embrace this. We've started to see things like immutable JS. We've started to use Redux, which is really depends on mutabili immutability, um, React, immutability, and then like Angular and Ember are kind of getting on board with, hey, maybe immutability makes our lives a lot easier. Um, 
in reason, it's type checked. You're not, you're not going to mistakenly mutate an object. Um, and so this might, is, it, is this too small? I can't fix it if it is, but OK. Well, that's good. Um, so you know, common examples, x equals 2, y returns x, x equals 3. This is a different x, right? This, this y is returning this one. You're, you're not going to mistakenly change something later in the file that you were depending on earlier in the file. Um, if you want to add something to a, to a list, lists are immutable. You get, it, you get back a new list. If you want to add something to a record, you get a new one. You don't change the old one. Um, but the place that reason comes down on this is there is also mutability if you need it. Um, so there is, a, there is a ref type, um, which Clojure also has. Um, where you can say, this is a thing that contains something. And if I, if I get it out, that'll give me the two. But I can change what's in it. And then when I get it out, it'll get me the new thing. Arrays in Reason are mutable. Um, and they, they end up being JavaScript arrays. The lists are linked lists, if you're familiar with that. Um, and I, again, I like this for ease of getting started, also for speed. Um, but the, the default, the things that are in all the standard libraries, is using the immutability, using um, the thing that's safer. And another super cool thing about Reason is it's multi-platform. Um, now, you might be thinking JavaScript is multi-platform, right? We've got web, we've got Node, we've got Electron, we've got React Native, we've got whatever. Um, now, JavaScript is really multi-platform, but it is not fast. It, like, you, you can run it anywhere, but it, it won't necessarily run fast. Um, and Reason will compile to native Mac, Windows, Linux, Raspberry Pi, whatever you want. Um, and so in, instead of going to your boss and saying, the server's too slow, we have to rewrite it in Go. We have to rewrite it in C++. We have to rewrite it in Clojure, um, even though Clojure's great. Um, you can stay in the same language and say, well, let's, we, we've been using these node libraries from Reason. We've been, we've been taking the easy route. Let's, let's switch to the OCaml native libraries, compile to native, and then you're still using the same language. Um, one of the cool things that happens there is you can share the type definitions between the client and the server. So, so when you make a REST API request, you're guaranteed that the types are going to check. You're, you're not going to send bad data because at compile time, it assured you that everything agrees with each other. Now the other thing that, that will help you out in the long run is BuckleScript, um, which is the compiler that, that turns Reason code into JavaScript. Um, it's a fast compiler, so it, it runs really quickly. If you're used to JavaScript build times, you'll be blown away, like tens of milliseconds to recompile um, a, a normal thing. And for like a really large project, like Messenger.com, it's in the hundreds of milliseconds instead of the many seconds that Webpack you know, kind of the, the Babel Webpack toolchain would give you. Um, and then one of the crazy things that this does, with all the information of the type system, with um, the really well-tuned compiler, if you take a look at this, it's kind of doing some interesting things. We call add to a couple times over here, but this function actually doesn't appear getting called anywhere down here because it was inlined. Um, in kind of an interesting way, so result, says do something complex, which is add to, add to, to string, and we just get 14.2 string. So it did constant evaluation. It did the addition because it was easy. Um, over here, this, this I think is even cooler. We're, we're assigning a value. We're using it in a record. We're getting it out of the record. And BuckleScript removes the middleman and says, hey, this was always Z to begin with. So th there's a lot of cool stuff that will optimize um, and make your code faster. Now, the, these, these are toy examples, but I've seen it in my real code where it's like, wow, it kind of did some complex reasoning that will save me um, several stack frames. And if it's in a tight loop, that, that can be important. So that's why BuckleScript, or that's why Reason is, uh, is really going to help you out in the long run in addition to just being easy to adopt. Um, the question I get all the time is, is it ready yet? Like, when I, I'm on board, I want to start shipping Reason. Um, this is kind of where we are. We're in the yellow. 
Um, if you'd come to me nine months ago, I would have said, uh, hold off. Um, because there's, I mean, it's, it's a newish project. There's a lot of stuff changing. Now, I'm kind of convinced that, that you can do it because actually there are, there are s several companies that are doing it. Um, Sean, who's here, um, is shipping Reason in production. Um, and now it's, it's not build with confidence. I'm not shipping it in production. Um, <laughs> at, at Khan Academy, we've, we've got a team of 60 front-end developers. And it's, I don't think it's ready to introduce into a team that size. Um, I think that's probably a couple years down the road. Um, where we are right now with Reason, I like to compare it to Rust two or three years ago, um, which is when I first got involved with it. But there wasn't as much community. There wasn't as much um, established practices around it. Now Rust is, is really cool, and you can, uh, I think you can use it with confidence in production. So here, here are the things that we're still working on. And if you're excited about this, help us. Um, so we, we want a, a solid standard library. OCaml has um, historically had just very interesting standard library things in that there are like five, and they're incompatible. Um, so standard is what we're shooting for. Um, and then like we, we want bindings to JavaScript libraries, more community packages, all the kind of documentation and tutorials and stuff that comes along with it. Um, so if that's your jam, come help us. Thanks. All righty. Cool. Uh, we have time, five, ten minutes for uh, questions. So Super fun. Yes. Um, so if I can get back to that, um, one of these things. Um, so the, the call tuples are a, maybe I didn't have any code. Oh, there was the syntax demo page, if we can get there. Um, here we go. <sighs> OK, there's got to be an easier way. Syntax, yes. All right, so this is still curried. Um, so it, it looks like it's not curried, but it is. Um, so you have all the currying, which is great. Uh, there was a second person, yeah? So my question is, how would you sell that? Let's say you're, you're happy with it and you want to sell it to a team. How would you sell it as opposed to TypeScript, which gives you a lot of Yeah, so I, I've used Flow in production for a year and a half. Um, and uh, TypeScript is, is quite similar. Um, and it's, it's not enough. It, um, it is 80% coverage when the last 20% is where all the bugs are. Um, and uh, so the, it, it's easiest if they've already tried it and they, they know that, oh, actually, there's still a lot of problems. Um, I would say, so TypeScript and, JavaScript and Flow still leave you with the JavaScript runtime. It still has JavaScript semantics. It still has all of the weird um, things that JavaScript does. It's, it's, a, it's a nicer veneer on top of it, um, but there's the same thing going on. Um, with, with Reason, you have more powerful constructs. You have some types. You have um, destructuring match statements. You, you have... Um, Lots of features. I don't know. I don't have a, a well prepared response for that. Okay. Do the you, you mentioned it before. You don't get all the mutability on its box. Yeah. Right. Like Mutability is huge. It's also pattern matching and whatnot as well. Oh, yeah. Right. Pattern matching. Yeah. Right. Um, not yet. Um, there, there's, there's still like tooling weirdness that you have to set up. You still have to, like, in, in terms of the people, um, in terms of making sure everyone on your team has it working in the editor with all the syntax highlighting and all the type hints and stuff. Um, 
I, I think there, it's, it's more effort on a large team than, um, than benefit at the moment. Um, well, we currently don't have source maps. <laughs> um, but, I mean, so Elm doesn't either. And Elm is great. Um, what, one of the things that BuckleScript has in our favor there, yeah, I'll, I'll get to you, um, is that the JavaScript that comes out is quite readable nearly all the time. Um, so having, so if, if I want to, if I'm debugging in the JavaScript, I, I know what's going on. There are, there are useful comments actually littered throughout saying, um, like, where, where something was alighted, like, oh, this was the name of the record. Th this was the name of the attribute. Um, so de debugability is actually reasonable. David. Yeah. Um, so th there's there's one aspect of the JavaScript interop that I didn't get into, which is um, you can represent a JavaScript object, and it is as a row polymorphic type. Um, if, if that makes sense. So you, you can say, um, like, th this object has these fields that I care about, and it might have more, essentially. So, so, you, so you don't, you're not burdened with specifying the whole thing. You're just like, oh, I'm just going to get these two things, and you can, write a, you can write a type for them. Right, if you use that kind of type. Yeah. So is it true for arbitrary metric structures, which say, like, I'm pushing some API on some search, and the other side decided to wrap the whole thing up in some other that's that's a problem, and uh, it, we're not going to search through the JavaScript to the JSON for you. So if it's if you've nested it, will it reach in there and find it for you? Right. Right. So if, I mean, if you have those requirements, you can write your JSON parser such that, yes, it will do that. But it's, this is not taken care of. Like, I have to actively take care of that. I cannot specify a, a type of, like, a nested object that just has these two fields. Oh, may, maybe I misunderstood your question. Um, so you could have a.b.c, and a also has f and g, and b has h and i. And I don't care about that. Right, or it's like the nesting level shouldn't matter. Say I have an object with a field, uh, is it raining? Yeah. And the, the next time I do the uh, request, I get like, uh, it's nested in another field. But I want to just know if like this thing I'm consuming has this field. And uh, if it has this field, my application search will find it. Does that make sense? Uh, yeah, you can definitely do that. I cannot imagine why you would want that to be the default. Yeah, that's possible. No, I just want it to work. That's, that's where I'm going. It's possible, yes. Are there in the back. Uh, was there a way to push things back in the tool? Because I, I heard that. Right? Maybe less than I'm not sure. Yeah. So, so the, the dream, one of the, there are many dreams. One dream is, um, separate the syntax from the code. Um, we're, we're working on getting it, we're working on adoption and maintenance. Um, that is uh, theoretically possible in the way that like CoffeeScript, well no, better than that. In the way that like Babel, you, you, you can do different parsers and whatever and it comes back to the same AST. The, 
all of the infrastructure is there. If you want to write a parser, actually, that like does closure syntax, um, it will like pretty smoothly interop with the whole system. Yes. Um, there's some really cool, so um, the Microsoft folks with TypeScript created something called a language server. Um, and there, there is a reason language server. Um, so it will integrate well with VS Code and Atom and Sublime and anyone that, you, that conforms to that uh, thing. Now, the OCaml folks have had a, a different thing um, for a long time that also works called Merlin. And I guess the language server uses Merlin under the hood. So, Long answer is, um, yes, it can be hard to set up, and we're trying to fix that. <laughs> um, you mentioned the immutability, immutability out of the box. Is it like, does it have some runtime cost? Um, it depends on what you want. Um, if what you want is constant time adding to the front of a list, it's a lot better than JavaScript, um, because you're using a linked list. Um, if what you want is, like, so th there, there are costs to the data structures you use. You can so for applications where I know that I'm that I have a fixed length and I want to do um, quick mutations, um, I use an array because it is fixed length and it's mutable. It's it's just trade offs on the on the JavaScript on the data structures that you yeah, choose. The question is more like if the language is immutable but it still compiles to JavaScript, right? Yeah. It runs in, in V8 or whatever. Right. But, 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 but at compile time, you can make sure that there's no immutability. Uh, immutability. Mm -hmm. So you don't have to have any extra code. So, so is your question, JavaScript is not built with immutable constructs at the run at the runtime level, right, right, so yeah. it will cost more than if it had? So if I, if I use some you know, crazy data structure that I will constantly add to, yeah. in, in, in JavaScript runtime, it will some, like, eventually run out of memory, or like, it's still, it's Start like running garbage collection cycles pretty much often, and uh, like I will fuck my application up. Right? So ev even if the runtime had native support for these data structures, there are there's algorithmic complexity that you're not going to beat. Um, so y I mean, you just choose the the data structure that works for your application. So it will still be my my uh, up kind of work to to do, right? Yeah. I think it was it was Colin who gave a talk back in 2012, something like. Um, abstractions at a low, low cost. I'm not sure who that was. Maybe he, he might be able to speak a bit about this idea. <laughs> <laughs> I have a different question, which is, so if you want to use immutable JS and you want to be able to say this is immutable JS vector of type X, can you yep. do this? Type that in Jason. So we have a library that is hash or remap tries um, written in Reason. Oh, okay. Um, okay. Yeah. Cool. And it's awesome. We, so the, um, we don't, currently have nice like syntax sugar for because for example if you use a list you can destructure it in a nice way um, you know head and rest and all that and hash remap uh, hash remap trees don't have the same like runtime implication like you yeah yeah Yeah. So are you all thinking about maybe doing extending OCaml semantics to modernize it a bit in areas like this? So um, we, th there's a lot of power we have just by changing the syntax. Um, and so if we say this new fancy syntax will call x function, then, then we can do that. You know, it'll translate into this dot get and this dot rest. Um, so that's definitely, um, an option for us, and I'm interested in pursuing it. Yeah. 
Yeah. yeah. We had that question. Um, it, it is it is a possibility, um, and what if if you want to write a parser that parses Lisp to uh, um, OCaml AST, um, it, it will fit in fairly well uh, with the compiler. So re reason is essentially doing that for this JavaScripty syntax onto this whole tool chain. So uh, Sean actually introduced reason to us last year, yeah. and um, I asked him a, a question about the module system, which I think got better this year with yeah. Webpack integration and so on. But um, can reason do um, like the whole program constant evaluation, like um, um, compile time function evaluation, and like that for the elimination now? So so cross module inlining yes, and, cross and all of that. Um, I don't know the specifics, um, but you, you could ask Bob Zhang, the buckle script developer. And then maybe an interesting side note there is like the OCaml <coughs> compiler has like several different intermediate layers. And so buckle script uh, has in it a very specific layer. And it issues some optimizations that are in the standard compiler. So it can do cool things like very readable JavaScript. Uh, but it gives up some of the optimizations that would otherwise be available. So it just it kind of depends on where you're plugging in and like what you mean by OCaml, right? So in this case, Buckle Script has its own choices. Maybe the native compiler has its a separate set of choices that it, it makes. But but I actually don't know whether the answer is yes or no on that. Yeah. So so when when I talked about immutability. Um, that is, so the list and the record, the, the record types that you make are persistent and immutable. Um, if, you, if you want the cool things that uh, Clojure and ClojureScript have, we also have a library that does that. Cool. I think that's cool. That's Super. Cool. Thank you a lot. <laughs>